Okay, so up until now, we talked about the theoretic model. But now we have data, and we want to use that data to estimate the factors, the Fs, and the loadings, the L. How do we represent the data? Well, we can look at each observation as a column. This is what is done in the modern factor analysis book. And then the equations would look like this. So this would be a P by N matrix, where P is the dimension of the data, and N is the number of observation. And L will be P by M, and F will be M by N. Or we can do row vectors, and then x minus mu will be an n by p. So each row is a p dimension uh, vector, row vector, and we have n rows. And then f will be n by m, and l will be m by p. Though we don't really need this for this video, since all of the calculation will be done on the covariance or correlation matrices. So when working with the data, we will use the sample covariance and the sample correlations instead of the model ones. So the sample covariance is just this. If we use uh, the unbiased one, we should divide by n minus 1. But if we use the maximum likelihood, we could use just the 1 over n. And then the estimate of the correlation matrix, capital rho, will just be, yeah, this covariance matrix multiplied by the inverse of the diagonal of it on both sides. And notice that if the data is already standardized or scaled, this is actually equal to the covariance matrix. So uh, there's no need of doing this because here the diagonal values will be one, the inverse of them will be one, and so these matrices makes no difference. Okay, how do we estimate all the different quantities that we have in our model? Well, the mu is very easy. We will just estimate it to be the mean of the variables from our data. This is the maximum likelihood estimator, and it's also a very intuitive estimator. For estimating L and psi, so the pattern matrix and the variance of the specific factors, there's a few methods. There is the principal component method, basically PCA. There's maximum likelihood. There's something called principal factor method. There's something called mean rest, and there's many other methods. I will go over these two methods, which is what the chapter nine of the applied multivariate book does. These three methods I might cover in a future video. If you're interested, you should check the modern factor analysis book. Okay, so what is the principal component method? It's basically doing PCA. We look at the covariance matrix, we do an eigen decomposition or a spectral decomposition of it into orthogonal matrix, uh, diagonal matrix, and the transpose of the diagonal matrix. And since this is a covariance matrix, we are guaranteed that all the eigenvalues will be greater or equal to zero. We can arrange them from the bigger to the smaller one, because they are all greater than zero, we can decompose this diagonal matrix into the multiplication of the square root of the diagonal matrix twice. Then we can do this and separate this and this. Notice that this is a diagonal matrix, so the transpose is equal to itself. And now we can write this covariance matrix as Q tilde times Q tilde transpose, where Q tilde is the q times the square root of the diagonal matrix. Now, this is equal if we take all of the p columns of this q tilde matrix. But what we could do, we could only take the first m columns, which are associated with the largest m eigenvalues. Yes, yeah? so we reordered q such that the first columns will be corresponding to the largest eigenvalues. And then we will get an approximation. If we'll denote the reduced matrix by L, then this will be L times L transpose. And it won't be equal to the covariance matrix. It won't be equal to sigma, but it will be approximately. Like We hope that it will be approximately equal, but it's not necessarily the case. M has to be large enough to capture enough of the structure of sigma. And so this gives us the commonalities. Yeah, this reduced Q matrix will be our L. This will be our uh, factor loadings. Uh, multiplying it and taking the diagonal will give us the commonalities. And now we can also calculate the specific factors. So the psi, if we subtract uh, L times L transpose from sigma and then look at the diagonals. So whatever we will have in the diagonals, we will denote it by as the psi. And so we got what we wanted. We estimated L, we estimated psi. We can also calculate the proportion of explained variance 
that this approximation or that this model gives us is just the sum of the ordered eigenvalues up to m divided by the sum of all the ordered eigenvalues. And so if this is large enough, I don't know, if this is like 90%, we would say, wow, our model with only m factors, we can explain 90% of the variance of our data. And notice that this is almost identical to PCA, but in PCA, we only take the Q matrix usually, and we project the data using the Q matrix. Here we take Q times the square root of lambda. Also in PCA, we take Q to project the data. Here we don't care so much about the data. Here we care more about analyzing the L matrix and making sense of the factors. So what are these factors? So this was one method, the PCA method. Another method is the maximum likelihood method. And here we have to further assume some distribution normality. So we will assume that F distributes normal. We already assume that its mean is zero and that its variance is the identity matrix. And likewise for the epsilon, we'll assume it distributes normal. We already assume that it's mean zero and variance, uh, diagonal variance matrix psi. So what this means, it means that X distributes normal with mu and sigma, yeah? So the mean of x we already saw is mu, and the variance of x we already calculated to be sigma, which is L transpose L plus psi. And so now what we could do is maximize the likelihood of our data, but not with regards to sigma, but with regards to L and psi. Now, there are a few problems to doing this. One is that there is no closed form solution. We have to use uh, iterative numerical methods. But the bigger problem is that there is also no unique solution. So there could be many L's and many psi's. And this is due to the orthogonal transformation, as I will show you later on in this video. So what we do, we have to add another condition to this problem. We maximize uh, the likelihood of our data with regards to L and psi, given some condition. And the condition that is given in the book is that we want this matrix to be diagonal. And so now we will have a unique solution the iterative numerical method will give us some one unique solution which we can use. Okay, so we estimated L and Psi, what about F? We can also estimate F and the values of F are called the factor scores. These are individual factor values. So for each observation in our data, we will have a different F. Okay, so for observation I, we will have XI and the associated FI. So we try now to estimate the latent unobserved variables, the latent factors, the common factors of each observation. There are two methods to do this. One is weighted least squares. So looking back at this equation of our model, we know that we actually know everything here. So we have the X, the mu, the L. We don't have F and we don't have epsilon, but we do know the variances of epsilon. So what we could do now is treat the epsilons as errors and try to minimize the squared errors weighted by the inverse of the variance. So if the variance of a certain epsilon is large, we care less about that error term. And if it's small, we want to try and fit and minimize that epsilon as much as possible. This is called weighted least squares. It's a part of generalized least squares, which I have a video about, and you should check it out if you don't know what I'm talking about. And so anyway, yeah, this is our error term. It's basically the x minus mu, which is the y in usual regression, minus L times F, which is the x times the beta in regular regression. Now we want to minimize this. The solution is, we already know what it is. If not, go check out this other video I mentioned. The solution will be this. And so notice that this is a least square problem of dimension P. So not of dimension N, but of dimension P. And we have to do this for every observation. So for each observation xi, we can use this least squares solution of dimension p to find the factor scores fi associated with xi. But also notice that this thing doesn't change. So it's uh, n problems of least squares, but in reality, this is just one matrix. We can expand this to be a matrix instead of a vector, and then just multiply the two matrices and get the results for all of the observations in our data. So this is one way of doing this. It's called weighted least squares. Another way of finding the factor scores is to use conditional normal distribution. Again, we have to assume normality here. We can look at the joint distribution of X and F. So 
uh, concatenate the x vector with the f vector, we assume they have a joint normal distribution, and basically that both of them distribute normal. We know the val the mean of x is mu. We know the mean of f is zero. We know the variance of x is sigma. We know that the variance of f is i. These are all our assumptions, yeah? And this is we calculated given the assumptions. And we know that the covariance between x and f is l, as I've shown previously in this video. So now we can use the rules of conditional distribution to find the distribution of f given x. So the general formula when we have two vectors that distribute multivariate normal is that the conditional of y given x will be equal to this thing over here. If we now apply this to our matrix, we will get that f given x distribute normal with this mean and this covariance matrix. And so now we can just set the estimates that we have for f to be the mean value of this distribution. And again, we have to do this for each observation, but this is just one matrix. This we can expand to be a matrix, and then it's just two matrix multiplication, and we get the whole factor of scores.